This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is October 16th, 2022, and I'm producer Pat. We have two interesting segments for you today. We're going to talk with our friend, Dr. Stuart Robbins, about lenses and barrel distortion and lots of things about lenses. But first, Adam takes a deep dive into an article he read that suggested that nuclear power was ageist, racist, and sexist. Before we jump to that, just wanted to let longtime listeners know that our former co-host and friend, Elon Dubrovsky, and his wife, Dina Serlin, who has been a frequent guest, gave birth to a beautiful daughter this morning. Both mom and baby girl are healthy and happy, and our congratulations go out to both. And with that, here's Adam. What's up, cuboids? Is nuclear power racist, sexist, and ageist. You may be thinking, no, of course not. What kind of a stupid question is that? But this was the question posed by a recent article, which got me thinking it might be worth talking about nuclear power for the show. Now, the article itself is a bit silly. I don't think it was all that popular, aside from basically people picking it apart to mock it. But I still think it's worth confronting issues like this and just talking about nuclear power in general. It's easy to reframe many issues to make them about race, sex, or some other type of discrimination to try to garner support from well-intentioned people. But unless there's a legitimate link, this may be a type of manipulation. You may want to be careful you don't fall into that trap. In the case of this article, which I originally saw on counterpunch.org, it was reposted from a site called Beyond Nuclear, which is a blatantly anti-nuclear organization. So that is not an impartial source, as this article will show. So why would nuclear power possibly be considered racist, sexist, and ageist? First, let's look at racism. Nuclear power comes from uranium, which, the article claims, has been mined by Native Americans and that this would continue in the future if the evil, not progressive enough Democrats have their way with bills like the International Nuclear Energy Act of 2022. Now, this seems to, on some level, have been true in the past, In the 1950s, a uranium mining belt under the Navajo Nation was exploited. Many Navajo people living in the area were employed to work in those mines. Health concerns uh, of things like lung cancer risk related to uranium mining was not known to the workers, and there was contamination to some of the water supplies. This this is, of course, very bad. It's very terrible. Some of this uh, probably could have been avoided. Some of this is due to just people not knowing as much back then. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has been cleaning this up since 1994. So it, it is bad. Um, people are uh, attempting to remedy the situation as much as possible. So does this make nuclear energy itself racist? Linza Pence Gunter from Beyond Nuclear seems to think so. It seems unlikely to me that the kind of safety nightmares which occurred in the 1960s would continue to take place in future uranium mining if that did happen to occur in the U.S., as opposed to, say, they could be reusing some uh, some spent nuclear fuel. There's a bunch of other options that could be going on. Now, the other issue is the location of uh, nuclear waste containment sites. Now, one that is mentioned would be at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, So the article goes on to mention that the area was the target of many nuclear bomb tests, which is kind of a dishonest comparison of nuclear power to nuclear bombs. Lingering fear of nuclear power plants, which are generally safe, um, often has to do with parallels people can't help make in their minds between nuclear power and the fear of nuclear bombs. The anti-nuclear environmentalist movement often compares these, and that's where a lot of those fears originally come from. The Yucca Mountain site was cancelled, also, it, it's like a solution to a non-problem. We'll get into that later. But so that doesn't really have a, a particular bearing on the future of nuclear power. The article goes on to discuss um, radioactive waste sites being near Hispanic communities. Um, these, these sites aren't dropped in the middle of highly populated inner city areas, but nuclear waste is generally safe if it's well contained. And we'll talk about that a bit later. A nuclear reactor is also mentioned to be near 
Shell Bluff, Georgia, where there is a high percentage of African Americans in that community. So unfounded claims are made about the local population being riddled with cancer and other disease. Nuclear power plants do not emit levels of radiation that are harmful to nearby communities. These neighboring areas would be much more negatively impacted by emissions from a coal or a gas power plant or something like that, which is often what is used as a, an alternative to nuclear power when these plants are shut down. All right, how about sexism? Ionizing radiation affects women more than men. This fact itself does appear to be true. Women have a roughly 35% greater risk of death from cancer caused by ionizing radiation. Now, the point isn't really relevant since modern nuclear power plants contain ionizing radiation, so the risk to men and women is mitigated. There's always going to be some small risk of exposure to ionizing radiation from something like an accident. Plants are made to mitigate this. There's a bunch of safeguards. Uh, they try to avoid it, but accidents can still happen. The much-publicized Fukushima disaster is estimated to have caused roughly one additional death due to you know, cancer resulting from the radiation from that disaster. The total death toll um, from the Chernobyl disaster, the exact number is not known, but it's probably in the ballpark of 200, 200 people. Not really the idea you would generally get from the way that these things are told. I couldn't find any specific numbers, but I suspect that most of the people working in nuclear power plants who have their radiation exposures measured and it's controlled to make sure they aren't exposed to too much. But I think most of those people are probably men. Uh, research on nuclear power plant employees has shown a possible link between the low levels of radiation exposure and certain types of cancer. So there's a possible link, but it wouldn't be huge numbers but uh, that's still a possibility. In some cases, this could simply be due to confounding factors like employees who work in these power plants are more likely to drink and smoke. Therefore, they're more likely to have some types of cancer. The article goes on to explain that the standard guidelines on allowable radiation exposure are based on a healthy white male in his mid-20s to 30s weighing around 154 pounds. So this is kind of like the crash test dummy thing where basically the average human is normally considered to be sort of a normal dude, um, which may not be inclusive for all sorts of reasons, um, for uh, sex differences, age differences, size differences, and stuff like that. Now, in this case, for radiation, it's not quite the same. Still, radiation exposure limits are significantly lower than what is considered dangerous for a man or a woman. So it's not like all of a sudden, well, the cutoff is like, okay for a guy, but it'll totally kill a woman. They're going to be much lower than that goes on to talk about pregnant women. Yes, maybe you shouldn't be working in a nuclear power plant if you happen to be a pregnant woman. But again, um, just living and existing miles away from a nuclear plant isn't dangerous to a man, woman, unborn fetus, child, elderly person, cat, dog, bird, whatever. So does this fact make nuclear power sexist? Is a dental x-ray sexist? How about the machine at the airport that scans you that emits some low levels of radiation. Well, that probably is sexist because it looks at you naked and someone can see the image, but still, some of these ideas are a bit silly if you look at them in that way. What's the alternative? A coal plant won't be better for women or men. Men generally get lung cancer uh, more than women because they smoke more, but when the amount of smoking is controlled for, um, women are at a higher risk of lung cancer due to similar exposure to cigarette smoke. Um, living near a non-nuclear plant, some other sort of power plant with emissions, is probably going to be worse for a woman's health, worse potentially for children and elderly people. So the nuclear power plant will probably save women. Is nuclear power ageist? Again, we're kind of coming to the same things here. The article says that children and the elderly are at a higher risk of negative health effects due to radiation exposure. So which is it? Is ageism against the young or the old? Probably both. Um, this all depends on the idea um, that there's exposure to ionizing radiation near the nuclear plant, and that has not been demonstrated to happen. I'm not just saying it hasn't been demonstrated. It just doesn't happen. There are safeguards against this. We understand what ionizing radiation is. We understand how to block it. We understand how to measure the levels it's, it's, it's taken care of. So the article mentions studies in Europe showing increased cases of leukemia in children living near nuclear plants. I did some searching and some studies do seem to be suggesting this, but it's worth considering that we're talking about single digit numbers of cases of leukemia. 
So a doubling in cases around one plant, for example, could be caused by a handful of cases. It's quite easy for such results to be caused by normal variations in small numbers of a rare event in small communities located close to some power plants. So this is just random noise is going to do this. A similar study of young children around a British nuclear power plant published in Nature showed no link between a child's proximity to a nuclear plant and cancer. So if you do this study enough times in enough countries around enough nuclear plants, you have these small variations, it is always going to show that some have increased risks and some do not. And if you kind of cherry pick those results, you're probably going to be able to prove the thing that you want to prove. There is probably no effect, but if there is an effect, it is a small effect with a very small risk. Now, I don't want to mischaracterize the author. She is not herself in favor of fossil fuel energy sources uh, and, and you know, uh, energy sources with, which make emissions, but by arguing against nuclear power, practically speaking, that's what's going to happen. Renewables are good, but they are difficult and expensive, at least they are in 2022, relatively safe and clean alternatives to fossil fuels like nuclear and hydroelectric are a feasible alternative that can produce a lot of power. So they're not just shutting down nuclear plants and just popping up a bunch of solar panels and windmills to make up for it. Okay, to sum up the article, is nuclear power racist? Depends what you mean by racist. I'm not going to nail down a definition because not everyone can agree on one these days. Certainly, some practices in the mining of uranium in the past have had a negative impact on First Nations communities, which could be constituted as racist, depending on how you define racism. Is it the intentional discrimination against a racial group, or is it an action which can have a negative impact on a group, even if that impact is not expected? Now, there's no reason for future nuclear power plants in the U.S. to be racist, as they say. The arguments about placements of plants and waste being racist is only valid if you accept the danger of that plant existing, which I don't. I reject it. Is nuclear power sexist or ageist? Now it would be more appropriate to argue that radiation itself is sexist or ageist. Uh, it is true that radiation has a disproportionate effect on women and certain age groups. This can be said about the negative effects of other power sources as, as well. If you manage the risk to all humans from radiation from nuclear power plants, you will not have to worry about this. You're not only going to protect men and not women and children and the elderly. As for using a male as sort of the standard to measure radiation by, these kind of things can always be improved, but the safety levels are generally much lower than what will cause damage. Okay, more generally, I want to touch on nuclear power and waste. Um, I, I've thought for a long time that nuclear power has been vilified needlessly. I think I talked about the Fukushima thing three times on the show. Um, but I found some interesting thoughts in a book I read a while back, Apocalypse Never by Michael Schellenberger. And I'm told this book has issues. So some of the specific things in the book uh, might, might, might not be right. I won't get a go into a deep dive in that, but I think the general idea in the book is good. And that is that uh, environmentalists who are excessively alarmist can be bad. This can cause bad consequences. For example, there are many people that believe that billions of people will die in the short term future as a result of climate change. Um, people are afraid to bring children in this world because they think the planet is doomed. This is an unproductive level of fear. It's not supported by the evidence, not supported by actual science. Uh, climate change is very bad. We should be doing whatever possible to avoid it, to mitigate it, to reduce its impact. It may superficially seem useful to assume the worst and that this will cause better things, but this is not necessarily the case. For example, if it seems like things are so bad that there's no possible fixing or mitigating the issue, um, then this can cause people to abandon otherwise useful approaches. It can cause extreme anxiety that we're seeing, especially amongst younger people with some of the messaging that's out there. It can cause um, extreme approaches, which can actually cause much more harm than they're avoiding. For example, if we restrict the developing world from the benefits which come from uh, you know, development and increased energy consumption, um, things that the West has benefited from for years, then basically you're going to cause a lot of harm, suffering, death as a result. So uh, additionally to consider is that lower technology solutions can end up being worse, um, where even lower energy consumption can cause a lot more emissions. For example, in a developing country, if someone is burning wood, coal, or fossil fuels, 
for their energy, they're going to be they're going to be causing uh, a lot of a lot of pollution where alternatives might be better. So I won't won't get into all the specifics of the book. You know, the author you know is is an environmentalist himself, comes from a background in Greenpeace stuff like that, and basically saw that um, through some of the activism that the people he was encountering, uh, there was things that were not productive. The author does talk about nuclear power, that it's generally good, much safer than the alternatives, and unnecessarily vilified. The fears of nuclear power go back to fears of nuclear bombs. And while these concerns may have at times come from a good place um, and, and that there might have been a valid concern, uh, as, as things continue, as the evidence builds up, it, it gets harder and harder to ignore the truth about it. So environmentalists that are still anti-nuclear Generally, they, they should know better. We're, we're at a point where you really shouldn't be saying that anymore. Anti-nuclear activism doesn't end up with cleaner alternatives. It generally means a higher reliance on fossil fuels, means more greenhouse gas emissions. This contributes to global warming. And we have um, clearly demonstrated that these things have a negative effect on people's health. So either the emissions directly or the global warming itself, which will cause uh, negative impacts to people's health. So anti-nuclear activism is bad for the planet. It's that simple. So is nuclear power the best approach? You know, people like to tout the alternatives. Perhaps there are other emission-free alternatives, but nuclear is a good way to get there. It's a good approach to use in the interim. And it seems like a wise approach and seems generally safe compared to a lot of the alternatives. The common criticism that people generally hear, at least from more scientifically literate people, so they're not really, you know, in with the fear mongering of the radiation itself, it's the issue of nuclear waste. So I found a nice thread on Twitter by Maddie Hilly, who is an advocate for nuclear energy. She's not unbiased on the topic, neither am I, but I, I want to kind of highlight some of the points she made. So nuclear waste it's a real thing. It is. It can be dangerous if it's not properly handled, um, but people make a big problem out of it when it doesn't need to be. So nuclear waste in general is spent nuclear fuel. Fuel itself is made up of metal and uranium. It's in the reactor for about five years, and it's cooled in water for another five years. Then it's placed inside these concrete casks, which are put in rows near the nuclear reactor itself. Since uranium is energy dense, the amount of waste isn't all that big. The total of every fuel rod ever used in a nuclear power plant would fit the space the size of a single football field that's about 50 feet high. I guess it's taller for a football field. I don't know. I don't know why we always use football fields, but it's a thing people like. The earth is very big. We have a lot of space. <laughs> we have a lot of space for the amount of nuclear waste that we are producing. Um, we, we don't need to be like walking on top and around barrels of, of nuclear waste that's glowing green and pouring everywhere. That's, that's science fiction. It doesn't uh, reflect reality. That said, a lot of the expended fuel rods still have a lot of energy left in them, and they can actually be turned into new fuel, and that's something that's done often. Nuclear waste is radioactive, and this is why it's stored and contained properly so that that radiation does not hurt people. The dry cask storage system used in nuclear power plants is safe, inexpensive, and has never failed. So it decays fairly quickly in geological terms. So 40 years after it's out of the reactor, the heat and radioactivity is down by over 99%. We wish all of our waste had this same kind of problem. If you contrast this with some other toxic waste products, which persist in the environment pretty much indefinitely, that's, that's better. Things like mercury, lead, cadmium, and arsenic are routinely stored as waste, but people generally don't have the same kind of concern about them as they do for nuclear waste. The Yucca Mountain site that I mentioned earlier is a solution to a non-problem because the waste being stored near nuclear reactors isn't hurting anyone. It doesn't have to be amalgamated in the middle of nowhere in these weird uh, places because there's no danger as it is. Is nuclear power racist? Depends what you mean, but it doesn't need to be. Is nuclear power sexist or ageist? Radiation arguably is, but nothing about nuclear power plants themselves need to be if they're safe. It's more likely that more nuclear power plants would mean less negative health impacts to women, children, and the elderly due to a reduction in fossil fuel burning. Nuclear power is a safe and efficient source of energy. There are concerns, and there are many safety considerations in place to address those concerns. Despite highly publicized accidents at some plants, the number of deaths that can be tied to those is very low much lower than the deaths caused by burning of fossil fuels, coal, things like that. Modern, safely operating nuclear power plants are considerably safer than most alternatives. Nuclear waste concerns are generally overblown.
Peace out, cuboids. All right, Stuart. In episode 579, Adam said, Barrel distortion, typically seen with many photographic lenses, such as a zoom lens, causes image magnification to decrease further from the center. So I take it this is you that wrote in with a correction on this? <laughs> Under a pseudonym or? <laughs> yeah, I, I looked through my email history and I don't think I wrote in. I think this was more of a case where I just asked to be on and then blindsided everyone. Uh. <laughs> so, so I actually, I re-listened to the segment um, in preparation for this correction that's not actually going to be a correction uh, because I don't think Adam actually made an error. I think that I was uh, queued up on a, a popular misconception and, and one that we actually spent a half hour talking about that was not recorded when I first visited you in uh, Toronto. I so, remember this conversation, actually. Yeah, yeah. So the issue comes with terminology. So what is a zoom lens versus something else? Um, so a prime lens is a lens that has a single focal length. So if you look through it, you will see a single field of view and you can't change it. So the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, assuming that you don't split this episode up into multiple ones. Uh, so we just talked about that and how it's sort of the equivalent, uh, or the field of view is equivalent to holding a grain of sand at arm's length. Right. Um, that is a prime lens. It can't change the focal length. You get what you get, basically. Uh, a zoom lens, on the other hand, is a lens that has an adjustable focal length. So you can zoom in and out uh, depending on what you want to look at. So, for example, I'm sure everyone here has a phone, or almost everyone has a phone with a camera on it. And you can zoom in and out with that camera. Now, that is the equivalent. Don't write into me about how it's not actually doing it optically, but that is the equivalent of a zoom lens. It has a variable focal length. A zoom lens can give you that variable focal length, but still be very wide angle. So for example, if I have a zoom lens that is 14 to 20 millimeters focal length, I can change the focal length, but I'm still going to get a huge field of view. Now, the other term with lenses is a telephoto lens. A telephoto lens is a lens with a very long focal length, uh, so it has a very narrow field of view, but that focal length is actually more than the length of the lens itself. So that might make absolutely no sense to most people. So let me try to explain it by way of example. I have a 400 millimeter telephoto lens. 400 millimeters is almost half a meter, which means that that's about a foot and a half long. Uh, however, the lens itself is only about eight inches. That means it's a telephoto lens because it can see, uh, or it has a very long focal length, but the actual physical dimensions of the lens is shorter than that focal length. And in order to accomplish that, they have to build in all these extra lenses inside of it. Like if you ever were to find a diagram, like a cross section of a camera lens, you would see that it's not just one lens, not just two lens, but usually it's like 11 or more lenses all stacked together in order to accomplish these really neat feats of optical physics. But the problem is that when you do this, it usually looks really good in the middle, but then you have issues on the outside. And this is the peripheral of the lens, and this is that barrel distortion that Adam was talking about. So as you get farther and farther away from the center of that lens, you get more and more distortions, be it chromatic aberration, where different wavelengths of light are actually refracted differently. And so that's where you get the, like a blue cyan fringing in photos if you look towards the edges. Uh, but you also get these sorts of distortion. Uh, so you get spherical aberration. And so you can add even more lenses in there in order to try to correct for that. But there comes a point where the optical physics just doesn't quite work out and you're always going to have these kinds of imperfections. Now, the reason why I wanted to go through this sort of pedantic and very, very long rabbit hole is this idea of a zoom lens is often used to say that that lens can see a very narrow field of view. So it's like it has a big magnification. So if I, if I have a long lens, people are going to look at that and think that it's a zoom lens, but that's not actually what a zoom lens is. And so when Adam said in that episode – 
that something was a zoom lens and it causes image magnification to decrease farther from the center. I was queuing in on the idea that he had a misconception of what a zoom lens actually is because it is true that a zoom lens can do that, but it's also true that a prime lens can do that or a telephoto lens and a telephoto lens can be a prime lens or a zoom lens. It's just one of those categories of things. So this was sort of me putting on my pedantic photographer hat and also <laughs> remembering that you and I had had a, a half hour, I think, conversation that yeah. I think it was right after it ended that Christina said, oh, we should have recorded that. Yeah. Hmm. So Stuart. You mentioned zoom lenses and then you said how it does it optically because it could also do it digitally, right? Right. So this is where I didn't want people to write in and tell me that I'm wrong about how a phone camera works. So a phone camera, at least I'm going to use the latest iPhone as an example because that's what I'm most familiar with. It actually has uh, – the Pro model has three different cameras in the back. And – those three cameras each have a different focal length. I believe, I could be wrong, uh, that each one actually can is a zoom lens and can go between its focal length and the next one. And then what you do is what Apple has done in software is it effectively continually takes pictures with all three of them. And then it seamlessly goes from one to the next to the next when you zoom in. But you do reach a point where the physical focal length of the longest lens, the one with the longest focal length, uh, when that physical focal length is exceeded, but Apple will still let you zoom in more. Then you're doing software or stuff in software where you are effectively – uh, taking a smaller and smaller portion of that image and effectively just increasing the size of it on the screen. So this is something that cameras have been doing for a while and why sometimes uh, they would advertise, and I think some still do, an optical zoom versus a digital zoom. So with an optical zoom, it is the actual camera optics, and that's what you want. For the digital zoom, you're just blowing it up effectively in Photoshop and hoping that you don't get artifacts. So the question is, is it doing something to fill in the blanks, which brings us to another discussion that we had covered on the show previously of AI doing some math. And I think it was a segment that you did, Christina, around the Chris Rock slap and possibly that he had some sort of padding on his mm -hmm. face. What about that, Stuart? I think that that is a good topic for a follow-up episode. Right. Pat and I always have a good giggle when we're watching – Whatever, it's usually a detector, like Mission Impossible or something, and they're like, enhance the image, and they enhance, enhance, <laughs> to the point where you could see every detail on the person's face from, you know, how far away. It's just, it's very silly. This would be a fascinating topic to talk to you about in a future episode, Stuart, because I know that when you were here the first time, not the second time, you were working on some software that was basically enhancing images, Using math, That's right. right? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about it next time. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. I couldn't find specific numbers, but I expect that people working in nuclear pants, <coughs> nuclear pants, check out my nuclear pants. They're freaking hot. Ionizing my ladies. Okay. Um. So for example, uh, I'm sure everyone here has a camera with a phone on, I'm sorry, a phone with a camera on it. That can go in the outtakes. <laughs> They couldn't figure that out, but then they eventually did. Uh, I don't know how, and actually, you should probably get rid of this example. So, backtracking more. <laughs> that was awesome. Sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's like, back in my day, we had to have these gigantic sound <laughs> systems in order to replicate the low bass. <laughs>